We've had guests on this podcast that are building the brains of the cars and trucks of the future. From Tesla, Aurora, Waymo, Wave. Today's guest is building the brains of the roadways of our future. She's building machine learning to predict the ideal infrastructure for our future mobility, to predict the cost of building this infrastructure, and most importantly, how do we do it so no one has to waste time sitting in a traffic jam? Yes, that's right. Her research is ensuring our self-driving cars won't ever have to sit in bumper-to-bumper -bumper gridlock. I am, of course, talking about MIT professor Kathy Wu. Kathy, welcome to the show. So great to have you here with us. It's great to be here. So, Kathy, of course, right now you are working on you know, machine learning and optimization for the future of transportation. But as I understand it, uh, it wasn't the you know immediately obvious choice as you're growing up, born into a Chinese family. How how did growing up in a Chinese family land you doing what you're doing right now? That's a really good question. I mean, yes. Coming from my Chinese family, I was supposed to be a doctor. I joke that I am just bad at following instructions, and I, I am a doctor now, just a different kind of doctor. <laughs> um, but I unfortunately, I mean, joking aside, I unfortunately found my biology classes like very uninspiring in high school. So I knew at some point before going to college that that was not going to be a viable path for me. Sorry to disappoint my parents. Um, but I kept that idea with me that I should be helping people uh, with my work. And mm -hmm. so starting from the first day of undergrad, I sort of, you know, looked around, looked left and right and tried to understand like, okay, if I'm going to be an engineer, which I knew I wanted to be, I wanted to be an engineer, how, how can I still help people? And so I really just looked into different kinds of societal domains from agriculture to energy systems to education and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, transportation is not like a natural first pick. And I would say that it really was self-driving cars that, that struck a chord with me. Um, I knew I wanted to be, uh, I wanted to study electrical engineering and computer science and all these other domains like uh, these EECS skills are sort of not like they're, 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 they're good, but they're not, they're not necessarily critical, like mission critical for some problem in healthcare where maybe there's a lot of like red tape that needs to, we mm -hmm. need to work around. But with self-driving cars, you can see the, the pathway from that technology coming to fruition and impacting people's lives, but also it cannot happen without computer vision, without, you know, path planning, and a lot of EECS uh, uh, methodologies. So did you already realize this during your undergrad, or when did this happen? Uh, Professor Seth Teller, uh, uh, who has unfortunately since passed away, during my junior year of undergrad, he gave a lecture uh, when I was competing in a robotics competition here, uh, at, here at MIT. And... It was actually this very interesting moment. And I, I think those of us who can experience this moment are very, very lucky where he gave that lecture and then everything else I was thinking about just melted away. And I knew that this is what I wanted to pursue. <laughs> and I reached out to him to work in his group. I joined his group. Uh, he was no longer working on self-driving cars at the time. He actually, actually led MIT's DARPA uh, Grand Challenge team. Mm -hmm. He was working more on assistive technologies at the time. So I worked with him for some time. And after a while, I told him, I think I still want to work on self-driving cars. And so he actually helped me pave the way to uh, working uh, in, in other groups and, and talking with the Google self-driving car team and, and so on. Mm -hmm. Well, I actually remember, not sure if you remember, Kathy, but I remember, I mean, you're admitted to essentially every PhD program, including Berkeley, which I'm very happy you came to Berkeley for that. But I remember talking with you during the visit days and I was so excited about reinforcement learning and the new opportunities there. And I, I knew your record, of course, I'm like, you know, very hopeful you're gonna be equally excited as I was about reinforcement learning. 
and and you tell me you know this is all very very interesting and those are great tools but i really want to you know start from the problem i'm going to solve and the problem i want to solve is transportation and i'd love to bring reinforcement learning into it as needed but i'm not just going to do a phd in reinforcement learning to move the needle on that i want to solve transportation that that's your goal now that, that was that to me was very surprising in many ways because most PhD students, in my experience, don't have such a clear goal in mind. Um, and you actually did it. I mean, you haven't solved transportation yet, but you actually went <laughs> down that path uh, very successfully and you're on track to do it. No, no, that, no, like, thank you for bringing that up. In my recollection of when I spoke with you, I, I said, I, I don't want to do a PhD in, in robotics, in like uh, sur surgical robotics or something. I, I, I want to work on. On transportation. transportation. And so actually, I, I forgot to mention the link between self-driving cars and transportation. Mm -hmm. I, um, I actually, uh, made an attempt, uh, as a senior to work for Google self-driving car team. At the time, I mean, I think mostly it was, uh, the teams from CMU and Stanford. Everyone had PhDs and whatnot. I didn't have any degrees. Um, so they weren't that interested to talk with me, but this is actually one of those uh, fortunate circumstances where I thought, okay, uh, I cannot, I'm not, I, I'm not prepared to work with Google self driving car at right now. I will build some skills that they will need in a couple of years. They're going to solve the one car driving around problem, not running into, uh, children, like identifying stop signs. I will start thinking about multiple cars and how they interact with one another hmm. and whatever that means. And I'll, I'll be able to join them in like two years. Uh, this was 10 years ago <laughs> at this point. <laughs> so a lot of people, when they think about the future of transportation, they think about how can a car, a self-driving car, avoid accidents? How can we maybe build flying cars so it can be up in the air and follow straight line paths instead of, you know, roadways? But you're actually thinking about something quite different than those two specific things. Yeah, I see. I really think about... Uh, uh, self-driving cars in the systems context. So we have a lot of systems level challenges like, uh, like congestion, like emissions, uh, safety as well can be a systems challenge as well, mm -hmm. uh, as well as like air pollution and things like this. And they are not the result of just a single vehicle moving around in space. Mm -hmm. uh, but they're a phenomenon that's created through the interaction of many agents in the system, many cars mm -hmm. interacting. So there's a nice study from about a decade ago that demonstrates the formation of traffic jams just purely due to human driving. So it's a scenario with no stop signs, mm -hmm. no traffic lights, no lane, no extra lanes or anything. And just humans driving together forms stop and go traffic jams. And it's this interaction between the drivers that creates interesting phenomenon. And so the extent to which we have this new tool in some sense of self-driving cars, how can we improve the system is a really exciting opportunity. So it's interesting because you're saying human driving, even when there is no traffic lights, no stop signs, no lane changes required, still causes traffic jams. And then in my mind, the question becomes, is it fundamental to safe driving or is it something just from the style, the way humans drive and maybe an autonomous car can avoid this? So actually there are studies about how uh, stop and go traffic jams, variations in speeds in roadways actually correlates with more accidents. Hmm. And so the extent to which we can mitigate congestion, we can potentially also improve safety at the system level, which is another really exciting aspect uh, to this. So I would not say that uh, human driving is like the gold standard by any <laughs> means. This, this is another aspect that I've come to really appreciate about working in this domain, that oftentimes when we think about robotics, uh, and, I, and I do have some robotics background, uh, oftentimes we sort of know what we want the robot to do. Like we know we as people are pretty good at like picking up objects. We're pretty good at walking, mm -hmm. but when it comes to driving, like, yes, we can drive and we can not crash into things, but we don't drive very well in a way that like improves the system. And so that's a nice mm -hmm. opportunity for self-driving cars. 
Say a bit more about that. How, how can the self-driving car actually improve our traffic situation? Ah, oh, yes. Okay, so this is now where our worlds <laughs> intersect, and we <laughs> we we start digging into uh, uh, reinforcement learning and and studying these systems with these uh, pretty advanced AI tools. More broadly, I'm very excited about how uh, reinforcement learning can actually sort of help accelerate the discovery of insights into these complex dynamical systems. And here's one example where if we use reinforcement learning actually to model uh, self-driving cars, we don't actually know what self-driving cars will do in the future because they don't like, they don't really they're not really pervasive yet. Mm-hmm. So let's use reinforcement learning to model them. And uh, these these reinforcement learning agents can optimize whatever we as a systems designer decide. So let's say we are we wish for the agent, the self-driving cars, to optimize for uh, the speed of the system. Mm-hmm. And what we found in numerically in numerical uh, experiments is that just a very small fraction of vehicles controlled, uh, mm-hmm. so five to ten percent, can have really outsized impacts on the system. Mm-hmm. Uh, so five percent of autonomous vehicles can basically eliminate traffic congestion in these model highway settings mm-hmm. uh, in a way that uh, we didn't um, we didn't realize was possible. Uh, even more so, like beyond congestion, we there are a variety of traffic phenomena that these vehicles are able to to help with. And we're starting to uncover these. So for instance, in like highway bottleneck scenarios, there are other forms of congestion that might form. And we're finding that again, like 10% of autonomous vehicles can, can mitigate this phenomenon called the capacity drop. Um, and we're also finding that self-driving cars can potentially aid emergency ve- uh, medical vehicles in oh. getting to their destination. And that has some safety implications as well. And so there are a lot of cases where we can start to think about, oh, we can model uh, self-driving cars as this like helpful agent uh, for the benefit of the system. And as I understand it, it doesn't need to be that every car is a self-driving car. It can be just a few or even just one that is doing the right thing and helps alleviate the traffic jams. Yeah, that's exactly right. So that's one of the aspects that was really important to me to study because uh, at the time when we were starting this work, it, it, it felt like there was a lot of, there were a lot of people studying like one self-driving car, like navigating the local environment, not crashing into things. And then there are people who study, uh, there's a lot of work that studies like, uh, systems where all vehicles are autonomous. And to me, that's like decades away. So I was really interested in what can we do when we start to have, uh, vehicles uh, rolled out like one percent, five percent. So it was a really important part of our study, and this is actually one aspect where reinforcement learning uh, really entered the picture as important because what we find for systems at the sort of periphery of what I call the like mixed autonomy spectrum between like zero and a hundred percent adoption of autonomous vehicles. The periphery actually has fairly well-established tools uh, from control theory and from stochastic systems. But in the middle, uh, we have this interesting space where the problem is actually more complex because we don't control everything and the scope of the problem is in some sense larger. Now, one thing I'm really curious about, I can definitely see how the mix of autonomous and human drivers makes the problem a lot harder than just autonomous, because just autonomous, you control everything. But I'm curious, on a one-lane road, a single autonomous car can alleviate traffic jams, right? And I'm curious, you know, one, do you see this generalized to multi-lane roads, let's say highways, and two... Is there any intuition into how this autonomous car is doing this? And let's say if I go drive, can I, you know, if I follow the right recipe, can I alleviate traffic jams just like the autonomous car would be doing in your system? Yeah, yeah. Well, these are great questions. Uh, so we are, we do have some studies that demonstrate generalizing the this like single lane uh, mixed autonomy result uh, for congestion mitigation to multiple lanes. The result is, uh, is really interesting 
there's one interesting um, maneuver that highway patrol officers actually engage in, which I didn't know about, but sort of emerged from some of our experiments. Mm -hmm. And this is called a traffic break. So oftentimes uh, on a highway, when there's after an accident, there's a lot of congestion buildup. Mm -hmm. And something that highway patrol officers will do is they will, uh, they'll just like sort of, sort of swerve in a sinusoidal pattern uh, across like five lanes of traffic to hold back the hold back traffic so that vehicles don't sort of just accelerate to some maximum speed and then like cause down cause more congestion downstream. Mm -hmm. And so that actually fell out of some of our, our simulation uh, analysis, like through use of reinforcement mm -hmm. learning. So I think that was really interesting. More recently, we've done uh, a follow up on this study and we've actually uh, uncovered that the reinforcement learning agent will actually learn to have the self-driving car use its blinkers to prevent other vehicles from maneuvering too aggressively oh. as well. So, you know, if you're signaling to turn, uh, to change lanes, then other people will sort of, uh, like, uh, let, let the car do so. And that's another way of issuing control, exerting control in the system. So I think the, the the extent to which like multi lanes are going to be fully addressed uh, is still is still out there. Well, my other question was, can I oh, adapt? Yes, yes. You know, some intuitive driving pattern that you found the autonomous car discovered in your simulation, so I can personally alleviate the traffic yeah. jams. So okay, that's a really interesting question, and it touches um, it touches something I'm really passionate about right now, which is our sustainability and climate uh, challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, so one potential for congestion mitigation is that we can reduce CO2 emissions uh, potentially in the near term if self-driving cars were ready, uh, but they're not ready yet. We still have safety and robustness issues. And so recently my group has been really interested in whether lower levels of autonomy could also mitigate congestion through uh, through um, more low-grade uh, types of instructions. Mm -hmm. And so we've been studying uh, what we're calling human-compatible uh, driving, mm -hmm. in which we, again, use reinforcement learning to now try to understand what are the engineering requirements, the technical requirements for mitigating congestion. We model a autonomous vehicle as a vehicle that can follow a instruction very well every, like, 0.1 seconds, you have a new instruction. But a human driver or an, or like a, another level of autonomous uh, vehicle, like a level two or, or below vehicle cannot necessarily follow instructions at like such high granularity and the sensing, maybe um, uh, lower fidelity as well. So we just went to the far extreme. We're, we're considering like, okay, for the human driver, uh, it can follow instructions every, I don't know, five seconds, 10 seconds, 30 seconds. Can we still mitigate congestion? And so we have some preliminary work out that indicates that up to like 15 to 25 seconds per instruction, uh, we can still mitigate congestion. Human drivers wow. can, it, it's indicating, uh, some, some early, early results that human drivers can also mitigate congestion. What you can imagine is when there's like a smartphone app, uh, giving some guidance on the, the, the right speed or acceleration to, to drive at. So instead of just running a regular GPS that tells us which turn to take, it'll what kind of instructions will it give us? What will it say? Yeah, so what we're hoping for, this is still early, like we're, we, we still need to engage in the human factors aspects of the study, um, but it'll be something as simple as possible. So the acceleration or the speed. Mm -hmm. So it might say speed up a little bit or slow down a little bit. That's right, that's right. And, and hold this for 30 seconds or, or so. Wow, that's so interesting. And this is all in simulation for now? This is all in simulation mm -hmm. for now. Yeah. And that brings me to another question, which is simulation and reality. Like, how, how well are they matched up and how do you make sure there's a, the, close, the close match is there? So we are starting to uh, form some uh, collaborations with human factors researchers so that we can put some of this into practice. Uh, my students and I, we have actually just like very, very roughly prototyped an app and then I have been personally testing it, oh. but it's not scientific <laughs> at all right now. <laughs>
But just to see, like, you know, are is this totally off base or not? We really want to know. So we're we're really serious about uh, about whether this kind of work can see the the light of day. Now, you you've been saying self driving cars could alleviate congestion, but some people also say, and you must have thought about this too, that self driving cars will make people more eager to jump into the car because they, you yeah. know, they can do something else. They can maybe sleep. And so how about that side of it? It's one of my greatest fears that we as engineers, we do all this work and we improve the efficiency of our systems. And then all the improvements get eaten up by uh, what's called induced demand, uh, which is what you've described. And so my sense is that we have to pair engineering improvements engineering innovations with, with policy, mm-hmm. with, uh, with other, uh, strategies that manage the induced demand, that manage the public perception of whether it's okay to, like, be wasteful, for instance. And that can take the form of, like, pricing. It can take the form, even beyond policy, it can take the form of, like, public messaging around, like, social responsibility. I don't think that this is purely a technical problem. Now, there's the cars, there's, you said policy might be needed. And in many ways, when I think of your work, I think of it as a, a way of somehow using existing cars to have the same effect as traditionally is achieved by building infrastructure. Normally infrastructure will maybe have a stop sign or a traffic light. And you're essentially saying, oh, if I can control a few of the cars on the road, they can induce a lot of those patterns. But are there still things that you think in our road infrastructure would need to change beyond just what, you know, a change to the software in the self-driving cars? One of my favorite examples in the self-driving car space is actually these highways that have uh, magnetic sensors embedded in the pavements. Mm-hmm. And If we were willing to put in the investment, which I believe is not so expensive, this essentially solves the localization problem, the problem of determining where is the car relative to the lane. So it also, it sort of addresses the problems of like, oh, if there aren't lane markers or if there's snow or heavy rain, uh, the self-driving car can know exactly where it is. If there's some little piece of infrastructure, uh, that, that is, uh, sort of helping uh, helping out. I really view uh, reinforcement learning as a really powerful modeling paradigm for understanding where we need sensing. What kind of sensing do we need? And is it going to be fully on board of the vehicle? Or is it going to be uh, sensing that can only be provided by the infrastructure? So for instance, uh, one hypothesis that we've long had is that in order to mitigate congestion, you need to have, uh, you need to have a notion of density of traffic. And the best way to get a notion of density of traffic is through infrastructure sensing rather than through like the, the only onboard sensing. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, we are able to use reinforcement, re- reinforcement learning to understand whether or not that is the case. So our, our research has actually indicated, at least at a pre- preliminary mm-hmm. level, that we only need local sensing for uh, mitigating certain kinds of congestion. And that actually has implications on the cost of the system. It has implications on whether or not we need to install uh, infrastructure. On the other hand, I'm a big fan of dynamic speed limit signs. Uh-huh. I think if we had those in a lot of places, we would, we would be able to mitigate a lot of congestion without anyone retrofitting any cars. And that's not too expensive to do, probably. Yeah, but you, it I sounds so. like you still would need sensing, right, to guide the speed limit. You say dynamic, so presumably it's changing based on yeah. the current situation. Yes, yes. We would, that would be an infrastructure solution rather than a pure software solution. So, so, Kathy, you've been mentioning how reinforcement learning is a really powerful tool at the core of a lot of, of what you're doing here. Can you say a bit more about what is reinforcement learning and how does it play a role in this work? Yeah, great question. So reinforcement learning is essentially this uh, paradigm at the intersection of machine learning and optimal control. And it is 
essentially about how agents learn from experience. And in particular, through trial and error, agents will uh, take some actions in the world, interact with the world, and get some sense of how well it's doing, uh, which we call a reward. And over time, the idea is that the agents are trying to optimize some objective. So in our case, this would be, uh, say, the trying to optimize the speed of traffic in the system or trying to lower emissions or trying to prevent accidents. We can start to ask questions about, you know, what if the agents saw like the whole system, then could they achieve congestion mitigation? Mm-hmm. Could they, uh, could they achieve congestion mitigation? Uh, if, you know, all vehicles are autonomous, if 5% of vehicles are autonomous, and we can sort of ask these questions in a scientific manner, but it could also be along the lines of how much of the world does the, does the vehicle observe? Does it observe all the vehicles? Does it only observe local information? Does it observe some other privileged information like the density of the system? And the, how much the, the vehicles observe have direct implications on the cost of deployment, on timelines of deployment, on whether, you know, we need to dig up for the roads and install sensors or not. And so through trial and error on our side, on the researcher's side, we can, we can sort of ask, we can start to restrict the observations, uh, that the agents can, can sort of see in the system. And we can try to get at you know, what is the smallest amount that the system, that the agents need to see and still be able to achieve some sort of capability? Wow, that's so interesting. And so I can also imagine that these these agents, they run reinforcement learning, they become better over time, that maybe if you expose them to more information, they, they learn different strategies than if you expose them to less and somehow with less information, they they figure out something more clever maybe that that still achieves a very good uh, behavior. Yeah, that's true. Now, you've been working on this for a while, and I'm curious, as you've been working on transportation and machine learning for transportation, how your vision might have evolved of how you see this play out, and where where do you see the future of transportation as a whole, but also especially the role of machine learning and AI in transportation? I'm very excited now like somewhat more generally about how reinforcement learning can help us accelerate the discovery of insights. Because I think I was trying to find one particular, I was trying to answer one particular question about self-driving cars and interactions with this complex uh, transportation system. And now I'm sort of envisioning that there may be other complex dynamical systems that it would take us as researchers a really, really long time to reason through ourselves, but reinforcement learning can help us, uh, like discover these capabilities, just like what we have done with congestion mitigation. We can potentially use this tool to help sort of point the way to what is even possible with future, uh, in this case, mobility systems. What should we actually be designing for? The world is changing like pretty Uh quickly and infrastructure decisions are long lasting and basically permanent. Like if you build a road, we can move it, but it might take 50 years Uh because you have to get everyone to agree to like Mm -hmm. move the road. So effectively, a lot of our decisions are permanent. Where we put sensors and we put them here, where we don't have the money to put them somewhere else. So we have to be really careful about how we make infrastructure decisions. At the same time, the world is changing. So we can't necessarily just use the requirements of mobility systems today to make those decisions. And so this is one aspect where I'm really excited about the the role of reinforcement learning as a modeling paradigm, because we can model what we anticipate um, we will need for future systems. The future is very uncertain. But there are sources of uncertainty that we at least know we should plan for. So for instance, we should plan for self-driving cars and other emerging technologies. We should plan for electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. We should plan for uh, climate change and, you know, other kinds of disruptions. We should plan for uh, changes in uh, consumer preferences. 
Uh, we have an aging population in the U.S. and in many parts of the world, and a lot of requirements will change. We we these are sort of known unknowns, mm-hmm. so we know we need to plan for these, uh, and so we can potentially leverage reinforcement learning as a modeling tool to help us understand how we can better plan for this. And the the other aspect that I'm really interested in is that these are really large scale systems. A lot of our work so far has been actually restricted by, by scale. Uh, reinforcement learning is very, very data hungry. Uh, mobility systems, cities, urban systems are huge. So we're, we're currently able to study, uh, like, you know, one intersection, one road, two intersections. A city has like typically like 20,000 intersections. Uh, and we are nowhere close. And so I think there's, there's also a really exciting opportunity. And we're also doing some work in this space in terms of how do we address scalability. Are there any cities that you think are a great model and <laughs> that will be better off with their current infrastructure? That's a good question. Um, I'm, I'm certainly not an expert on, on, uh, international, uh, infrastructure. Uh, but I am aware of there are some places that are sort of just building cities from scratch. Mm-hmm. And that's admirable. It's a nice opportunity to at least capture what we know now. I mean, I think they'll have the same problem as as the world uh, changes. When people think about the future of transportation, one thing that comes to mind for a lot of people is flying cars. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's part of a lot of uh, science fiction and so forth. So... What's your take on that? I'd uh, love to receive my Amazon packages uh, by, by drone. And, uh, <laughs> and I think there's a really, I mean, it's really compelling. Uh, you know, if we can lift our 2D traffic into 3D, it's possible that it'll take a, a really, really long time before we hit congestion again. <laughs> I do have a concern around the, the energy cost of, you know, like, lifting lifting this all the vehicles up in the air uh but i think it's very exciting mm-hmm. and then the other direction is the tunnels right <laughs> i love the idea i mean it is also an infrastructure um solution right you can't just have software you actually have to go dig that tunnel yeah <laughs> uh so i mean i mean i love the i love the idea yeah but so i mean there isn't too many of them yet but is this something you've been thinking about yourself? You know, how, how would this, how would the landscape change of, you know, traffic landscape? Where would the optimal tunnels be? Or is, is this a little too far out still? It's a really good question. I, I have not thought too much about flying cars or underground cars uh, too much myself. I would say there's, um, there's an, an area of research that I'm really interested in, uh, which has to do with learning for combinatorial optimization. Hmm. And this is the idea of trying to devise some general purpose algorithms uh, for combinatorial problems. So, for instance, when we do have um, flying cars and underground tunnels, these are going to be different network optimization problems than we have today. And uh, these are also going to be large scale. They're going to be difficult to solve. We're going to need a lot of um, heuristic methods because these are these are generally computationally intractable problems. Mm -hmm. So another way that I'm really excited about for uh, like trying to anticipate the pace of change is to actually design algorithms such that when the change starts to occur, we have algorithms already ready. Typically for combinatorial optimization methods, we may need years or decades to perfect a heuristic that is specialized to the problem, especially for large scale problems. And so this, we, we basically design an algorithm. It's a supervised learning approach that helps to accelerate existing heuristics by up to a hundred times. And it's like, a, it's a decomposition oriented, oriented method. And this is a, this is a first step for us to, uh, produce some algorithms that aren't so reliant on hand designed heuristics that may take uh, decades to, to form when these new problem variants arise. So Kathy, you pretty recently finished your PhD and became professor at MIT. It's of course a really, really exciting career path that I imagine many people are aspiring to. And I'm curious, do you have any advice for PhD students? Maybe they could give your own PhD students 
And also maybe any advice for people who are starting as professors somewhere? Uh, for people starting out in grad school, I highly recommend going to as many seminars during your first year, meeting as many people in your cohort as possible. Uh, these are the people who are going to be with you for the next five or however many years. And you will learn way more from them than the, I don't know, half hour or so you spend with your PhD advisor every week. So that's what I would say for uh, folks starting out in grad school. Uh, for folks starting out as faculty, so I'm in my, um, uh, starting my third year as a faculty member now. Uh, I'm actually going to, uh, echo some advice that Peter actually gave me, um, before I started, uh, which is, um, to really not worry about anything just, and just to focus on doing great research. There are so many, uh, so many kinds of things that compete for your attention when starting out as a faculty member. Uh, the biggest one is, uh, is teaching, is preparing new courses. There's also fundraising. There's, um, there's getting to familiarizing yourself with a new environment. There's recruiting students. There's, there are all sorts of tasks that sort of takes away time from, from research, but uh, I, what I found in even the last couple of years is that if one focuses on doing great research, the other things sort of work themselves out. And so it's really, really worth not worrying about those things. So thank you, Peter. I'm glad that advice worked out, Kathy. Thank you so much for coming on. This was really fun. Thank you so much, Peter. This was really fun.